There are three rules to being a firefighter paramedic. Rule number one, <laughs> always look good. Rule number two, know what you're doing. Rule number three, if you don't know what you're doing, revert back to rule number one, always look good. I walked into the fire station on a Friday morning, looking good, with a smile from cheek to cheek, greeting everyone. From the outside looking in, I was the happiest as I could possibly ever be, not a worry in the world. From their perspective, they see a single 28-year-old firefighter with a badass career. Shit, I fight fires for a living, and I have a beautiful home. Once again, in their eyes, my life is good, real good, and it is. But the reality, I started work that morning in an ocean of tears, and I had no way out but to drown in them. See, the woman I loved had left me for another guy, and she told me that she no longer needed me in her life. And to be honest, she left me feeling that no woman will ever need a guy like me. I cannot show my true feelings at work. I had a job to do, people to take care of. Plus, the guys will probably make fun of me if I express my emotions over a girl. As the day continued, I continued to put on this false personality, I smiled, I laughed, I joked, daylight turned into nightfall, and we all went to bed. The overhead alarm woke us up from a deep sleep. I rushed to the fire engine. I put on my pants, put on my boots, making sure I looked good. No matter how tired I was or how heartbroken I'd been, I got into the fire engine, placed my headset on. What do we got, Cap? I asked. He responded in his thick Boston accent. 29-year-old pregnant woman, contractions less than a minute. We rushed through the streets of South Bay, lights on, sirens going. We arrived to the street where the apartment complex was in. It had over 100 plus units. As we looked for the apartment, we see kids jumping up and down, screaming, trying to grab our attention. The fire engine brake sets. Air brakes to a firefighter means one thing. It is time to go to work. I step down the fire engine. A kid runs to me, tugs me on my shirt. Sir, my mom, she's in pain. Please help her. I walk down the fire engine's medical compartment. I grab my airway bag, my drug box. I make my way to the first floor apartment, and there she was, lying. Back on the couch, naked, knees bent, hips up, hugging her husband as she screamed in pain. Good evening, ma'am. I am Carlos. I, am, I will be taking care of you today. She responds, it fucking hurts. I would like to take a moment here and say that that husband is a trooper. With every contraction the woman had, she tightened her chokehold on him. It has been one of the best MMA chokeholds I've seen in my life. I told her, ma'am, I understand you're in a lot of pain. We need to help control your breathing. I responded as I instructed my partner to coach on her breathing. Sir, I will have to ask you the questions. And the ma'am, please correct us if any of the information is wrong. As her husband grasped for air after being let go by his wife. I asked him a series of prenatal questions. He responded, she is nine months pregnant. She has received prenatal care. She has been pregnant four times. She has given birth three. No expected complications except she has a scheduled C-section. The baby's expected to be 12, 12 pounds, he responded. I couldn't help to think to myself, did he just say 12 pounds? <laughs> See, compared to everyday objects, what 12 pounds looks like is a vacuum cleaner, a mini fridge, a 40-inch TV. <laughs> I begin to look for crowning. That is when the baby's head begins to be visible. As I look, I still cannot think to myself, how the hell is a baby gonna fit through the vagina? <laughs> there is no way. I looked outside for the ambulance as it was just pulling up. The patient begins to scream in pain. Contractions have now gotten to be less than 20 seconds. I am 28 years old. I have never delivered a baby. Sure, I read about it. I've seen it in movies. See, in paramedic school, I was taught about all possible complications of delivering a baby.
but I was never taught what to do if the baby's goddamn 12 pounds. God damn, that is one big baby. I took a deep breath. I told myself, Carlos, remember rule number one. Look good. Transpire confidence. See, the theory behind this is people don't call because they are having a good ass day. They call because they are having one hell of a bad day. In moments of chaos, we are expected to transpire confidence, be calm. The last thing they need is for me to be freaking the fuck out. Decision time. I had to make a quick and accurate decision. On one corner of my eye, I see the ambulance pulling up. On the other corner, I see the patient ready to give birth. Do I get the patient ready for transport or do I deliver the baby knowing the risk that it could suffocate and die at birth? The fate of this baby is literally in my hands. I take a deep breath. My heart is literally pounding out of my chest. I look at my crew. Get me ready. We are delivering this baby. I like to compare my crew to a NASCAR pit crew because everyone has a job. One is dressing me up, the other one is putting sterile gloves on me, the other is putting goggles on me, and my captain is telling me, you can drop your gloves, you can drop your stethoscope, but you better not drop this baby. <laughs> Crowning begins to occur. I ask the mom to push. She begins to scream in pain as she pushes. Baby begins to inch out. With every scream she pushes, the baby's inching out. She is giving me everything that she has. Every fiber of her body wants her baby out. But it is not enough. Baby doesn't move forward anymore. At this point, the baby got stuck. It has made it to the bridge of its nose and it won't move anymore. I have seconds to make a decision to save this baby's life. One second turns into two seconds turns into three seconds, which feels like a fucking eternity. The baby head is starting to turn blue. The baby's begging to be out. It is literally suffocating being stuck in that position. I grab my left hand, I make a V. I insert into the mom's vagina. I grab my right hand and insert over the baby's skull. I take a look at mom and I tell her, I know this is going to be very hard but we need you to give us everything that you have. She pushes as hard as she can while screaming at the top of her lungs in pure pain. As she pushed, I pulled the baby out and it came like a cannonball. <laughs> Mom loses consciousness. I grab the baby. It is not moving. It is blue, not crying, limp, completely dead weight. See. In the emergency medical world, this call I'm describing, it is the worst call that we train for. It is the call that we don't want. It is the call that causes PTSD. It is a call that won't allow a paramedic to sleep at night. If I don't save this baby, a portion of me will die with this baby. All eyes are on me. Literally, the weight of the world is on me. I look at my partner, pass me the suction. I need, you to, I need you to grab me the scapula and clamps. Cap, I need you to pull out the bag bound mask. Ambulance, go with 10 mom. I suction the baby's nose and mouth. Tell my partner to dry her and stimulate her. I grab the clamps and clap the umbilical cord and cut it. I grab the baby back from my, from my partner. I recheck the pulse. It has now dropped to 60 beats per minute. This is very bad. Anything below 60 beats per minute will not sustain the life of a newborn. I begin CPR. I tell my partner, we are going to the back of the ambulance. Ambulance crew, package mom, because we need to leave now. In the back of the ambulance, I attach the baby to the monitor, pull out my IV kit, start IV, begin drug therapy. I have now been doing CPR for a minute. My partner is breathing for the baby. Two minutes go by, no reaction. The pulse continues to drop. The mom is being brought into the ambulance. Sir, can I have my baby? Sir. Is my baby okay? The ambulance was filled with silence. I take a deep breath and look at mom momentarily. I am doing everything I can to save her. Four long minutes of CPR go by. The baby's starting to move her arms. I start compressions. I recheck the pulse. It is 160 beats per minute, which is good, but I need to sustain it there. I stimulate her, get her to move more. My purpose is to want to make this baby cry and take her first deep breath on her own. As I am stimulating, she stops all movement. 
on her extremities. She raises her arms as she was stretching, frowns her face, opens one eye, looks at me, well, kind of mad dogged me, and takes a deep breath on her own and lets out the most beautiful, awfully annoying cry ever. But God damn, that was music to my ears. <laughs> I have always looked up to the image of firefighters and hoped that one day I would be someone who looks, people look up to. That image doesn't mean much when you're in thick of things. Now, the only thing that mattered was whether that baby and that mother would survive. It wasn't about me anymore. It wasn't about rule number one, looking good. In all reality, it was something much bigger than myself. And this led me to rule number four, it is not about looking good, it is about being good. Yeah. After we dropped mom and her baby off at the hospital, I couldn't help but to sit inside the fire engine in silence and reflect. Hours before me, the woman I loved told me she did not need me anymore, that no woman would ever need me, but the reality of it is, that was not true. She may have not needed me, but life reminded me who the fuck I am and that no one dictates who you are, what you stand for, because she may have not needed me, but this woman and her baby showed me what it meant to be needed. Life is short and fragile, and many of us take it for granted. I know I did. That night, something in me changed. I witnessed a mom against all the odds and pain that came with it push a 12-pound baby out of her and the baby found the courage to fight for its life, and I found the courage to release my ex from my mind needing her, from my body wanting her, and from my heart loving her. Car Carlos Aguayo.